This conference Thank will you, now be recorded. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day, this time together, Lord. We lift up this uh, audio portion of our of our uh, time together tonight, and we ask that you fix whatever ails it. You are our great physician, and you're even our technology's great physician. You are able. We know you are. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens. And um, we trust that we can cast all of our tears on you. We uh, trust that you will supply all of our needs according to, to your riches and glory. Father, um, we lift up a praise to you for Richard and Bet uh, Stoltz. Stoltz. Uh, he is recuperated from COVID. Father, and no nurse follow-ups are, are required going forward. Uh, we praise that you healed my mother of COVID, and she just turned 93. We praise that uh, Diane Sabum has recovered from her elevated temperature after a COVID shot. Uh, Father, we we uh, lift up Mike Sabum for his shoulder surgery on Thursday, and we we pray for the little community of of Hiawassee, which seems to be have an abundance of COVID going on right now. And Lord, you know this situation. You are able. We know that all things are possible through you and that we can safely rest in you. Father, we love you. We will give you all of our our prayer requests because there are many for our country, for, our, for community health issues, for uh, people's salvation. We praise you for... Uh, Gary uh, Leonhardt's salvation, and Lord, we have been praying for him for a long time, and we know that you're faithful, and you have answered that prayer, and we're so thankful to you. Father, we lift up um, all the prayer requests, spoken and unspoken. We know there are many in this group, and those who couldn't be here tonight, um, we're thankful for Fran continuing to heal from heart issues, as well as... Uh, uh, Karen Dabney and uh, Wolf Rogers fully healed. Um, Lord, you've answered our prayer for for healed hearts, and also we lift up um, spiritual heart issues as well. And we ask that you heal those as well as we cooperate with your Holy Spirit. We're so thankful that we are able to come to you in repentance and know that you can answer our prayers and you will answer our prayers, uh, and we will do our best to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and become more and more like Jesus as we cooperate with him. The Spirit can work on us and and mature us in the faith. And Father, we can safely trust in you. It's in the power of Yeshua HaMashiach. We thank you in advance in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I just want to remind you all that uh, starting Thursday, um, I'm going to select a new um, uh, connection uh, web link uh, for our next meeting Thursday and then moving forward. Uh, well, I've been using the same link for a long time, and there might be a problem in doing that, so I'm going to select a new link, Yay. and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll not have the same uh, audio difficulties uh, next week. And welcome to Sheila and Dan. Uh, welcome back. Glad you're here. If you're following along, uh, we are um, in Acts chapter 12, and we're starting this session or this study in verse number one. And we're dealing with one of these situations uh, that is a challenge to our faith. Uh, we have some of these experiences many times over the course of each of our own lives. Uh, and what what is the challenge to our faith where we we get etched something into our mind, our plan or our vision for our life is etched into our mind, and, and this is how I expect my life to go, and this is how I expect the kind of marriage I want and the children that I want, and we have and the kind of retirement that I want, and we have all of these expectations according to our human nature. And then we end up running into something that comes into our life that's beyond our control and our expectations begin to crash and burn. 
And the problem is that way too often our expectations do not align with the written word of God. And uh, when our expectations uh, are not in alignment with the word of God, uh, that means that God is not part of the planning of what our expectations are. And we have our own expectations and our human nature wants to hang on to our expectations uh, because that's all that we know. We truly do not fully understand God's plan for our life. We truly do not fully understand the, the, the written word of God, but yet our human nature wants to hang on to that which we know. And when those things that we expect in our life get interrupted, uh, it has an effect on our faith, and we really don't know what life is going to be like on the other side after we finish this life. And so we're attempting to figure things out. Uh, we're attempting to figure out what God has in store for us. And we're told through the prophet Isaiah uh, a message from God where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts my ways are not your ways for as the heavens are higher than the earth my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts understand that god is a whole lot smarter than you and he's a whole lot smarter than me and when you and i find ourselves in disagreement with god you need to understand that you're wrong <laughs> All right, when you, you and God don't align, you're wrong. Welcome, Pamela Sage, who is visiting with us from Michigan, Michigan. tonight. Good to see you, dear. Freezing. <laughs> and uh, uh, you need to settle within your mind uh, that God is right and you're wrong. And so what the Lord, um, sorry. Uh, what the Lord is encouraging all of us to do is just to submit to him, obey, be obedient to his word, his commands. And if we just do that, you're going to find the grace and the peace that God wants you to have in your life. And so as we get into this study, beginning in verse one, we read that it was about that time that's the term that's being used now what does that time mean this is referring to the fact that it's about 12 years into uh, since the beginning of the church it's been about 12 years since jesus ascended up into heaven and now for the first time the church has been reaching out to the non-jewish communities god is doing some incredible um miracles and incredible things uh, throughout the Roman Empire. And now we're up into the city of Antioch, which is uh, 300 miles north. Uh, there's about there's going to be about 100,000 Christians. And so just when the church is thinking that it has turned the corner on all of the persecution uh, that it's been receiving, the government, the Roman Empire makes a decision to take a different approach to do a different format of persecution against the church. So that gives you a little bit of background on what we're doing and what we're studying. Uh, Renee Stratton, if you would read verses one and two, nice and loud. Okay. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. All right, so this is, this is not a shotgun approach nor a broad spectrum attack against the church. It's not like what Saul of Tarsus was doing where he was persecuting everybody and, and having men and women put into prison. This, uh, that was a more widespread persecution. What the government is doing now is they're targeting specific leaders 
within the church and their their intent is to get these leaders and to execute them now the herod which is referenced here and there's a lot of herods that are referenced in the gospels and the book of acts this is herod agrippa now herod agrippa was the grandson of herod the great and you remember that herod the great was the guy who ordered all babies to be executed at the time that Jesus was born. Uh, Agrippa's dad was Herod Antipas, uh, who was an absolute and complete nut job. We talked about him last week. And so this young guy, Herod Agrippa, uh, had very little hope for normalcy in his life with a father and a grandfather that were absolute cold-blooded murderers. And yet, God is sovereign. God has Herod Agrippa marry this gal who was a descendant of the Maccabees. And if you know anything about the Festival of Lights and the and the uh, history behind the Festival of Lights, also called Hanukkah, you'll know that that the Maccabees were national heroes in the eyes of the of Israel. And uh, we celebrate that great event each year in the month of Kislev, uh, which usually comes around December time. And so Agrippa's wife, uh, as God would have it, welcome, boy, glad you're here. Herod's wife, Herod Agrippa's wife, is a descendant of the patriots of Israel. And so because of this, Agrippa was very popular with the Jewish leaders. Uh, and uh, any of the Herods, uh, of all the Herods that were out there, uh, um, uh, the Jews liked this guy because he married a Jewish patriot. And because of that, Herod Agrippa is not turning his guns towards the Jews, but rather what he's doing is he's he's in alliance with the with the Jewish leadership and he's attacking the church he's attacking the church notice that he commands the execution of james now james the brother of john back in this historic era the jews had four ways of carrying out capital punishment they would either stone somebody or they would burn somebody uh, uh, on a stake or they would strangle somebody and the fourth way is that they would use the sword. And the Jewish law stated that anyone who drew a Jewish person away from Judaism, and of course that reference to Judaism is rabbinic Judaism, but anyone who drew a Jew away from Judaism to another form of worship, uh, they would call it strange worship, was to be killed by the sword. And so James, no doubt, was leading people to Jesus Christ. Uh, the Jews claimed that he was leading people towards a uh, false religion. And so they took the sword and executed him by cutting off of his head. Now, we get a little bit of insight from the early church historians who tell us that the soldier, this is quite fascinating, the soldier who was guarding James before the judge was so, uh, he was so affected by, by the witness of James that because when, when James was being judged and ordered for execution, this particular guard decided to give up his life in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, he too uh, was executed along with, with James. And that's a great insight because uh, you don't hear a lot of these types of, 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 of events, but here is a guard working for the Roman government that was so taken by the witness of James for Jesus Christ that he gave up his position as a guard uh, to take a stand for Jesus Christ, and he too was um, 
was executed. Uh, so notice, notice here that James is not weeping, he's not crying, he's not complaining, he's facing the sword, he's not freaking out, and he's standing strong in the face of opposition, uh, so strong that that this man, the guard, also converts on the spot and gives up his life as well. And so here you've got Herod Agrippa, a man who is full of himself. Uh, he's one of the wealthiest guys at this time in history and within the whole world. And he thinks he's calling all of the shots over humanity uh, because he has the power you know, to end people's lives by executing them. But what we're going to see as we get more into this study, at the end of the day, it's not Herod Agrippa who is the supreme ruler of the land, but rather it's the Lord Jesus Christ who mm -hmm. reigns supreme. All right, uh, Roger Hershey, would you please unmute and read verses three and four, nice and loud. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish leaders, he, ar he arrested Peter during the Passover celebration and imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended, Herod's intention was to bring Peter out of, for public trial and after the Passover put okay. after the okay. Passover. All right, so what we see here, um, uh, this plan pleased the Jewish leaders. They executed James, and now they arrest Peter. And Peter now is in prison for an entire week during the week of Passover. Where are you, Rob? Isn't it we are in um, Acts chapter 12, the first four okay. verses. Okay, thank you. Um, isn't it interesting that uh, during the festivals uh, that the Jews don't push execution? They wait. They're waiting now for the full Passover week to pass, the Feast of uh, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened, uh, the two first uh, uh, first of four spring festivals. Uh, so the Jewish leaders are 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 pleased. Uh, they're going to wait, uh, hold Peter in prison for an entire week. Um, and, and no doubt the Jewish leaders warned Herod, uh, that Peter needs to be watched closely because he's kind of a slippery guy. He's escaped in the past. I don't know if you remember in the history of the gospels, you remember that the Jews arrested Peter and an angel miraculously broke him out of jail. And so just to be certain, Peter is under the supervision of four quad uh, trinians. It's called a quad trinians. Now, this was a group of four soldiers. Two would be chained to each one of your hands. Um, um, and the other two would stand guard outside of the cell. And so you would have four of these groups. So there were four quad trinians. Uh, and then they would work a three-hour shift, and then uh, the four guards would then be off for nine hours. And what they would do is they'd have these four groups of four uh, alternate over a 24-hour period so that nobody would get tired and no one would lose track of the, um, of the prisoner. And so it was called four quadrinians. And, uh, and so, um, they would work uh, for a certain number of hours and then they would rest. And so here, from a human perspective, it doesn't look very promising for Peter uh, and his situation. He's surrounded constantly by 16 soldiers and they're determined at the end of the week of Passover that they're going to execute Peter. All right, uh, Joyce DeWalt, if you would unmute yourself and read verses five and six, please, nice and loud. Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayers for him was made to God by the church. 
Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. All right, so the word prayer that's used there in verse 5, it has the meaning of praying without ceasing. Uh, this was a medical term that Luke has used in the past in his gospel that had the meaning to stretch a muscle to the maximum limit. In other words, it was intense praying. It wasn't the kind of prayer, well, thank you, Lord, for this food, amen, and that kind of a thing. This was intensive praying that without ceasing, and the apostle is on the edge of being executed here. It's a very intense moment, and these guys are very serious about praying for Peter. It's the very same word that Peter used earlier in his gospel, where he said that Jesus prayed in agony, or he prayed more earnestly, and as he prayed so earnestly that the sweat of his brow appeared to be great drops of blood. I'm sure you all remember those verses that we studied in the Gospel of Luke. And, and, and that's the very same word that's being used here, that the people are praying seriously or intensively for Peter as he's in this particular situation. All right, Arnie and Helen, if you would unmute, nice and loud, read verses 7 through 11. Nice and loud. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me the angel told him and he went out and followed him he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision when they had passed the first and second guard they came to the iron gate leading into the city it opened for them on its own accord and they went out and went along one street and immediately the angel left him when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. All right, terrific. So, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind when you read these verses, you, you, you have to wonder almost if Peter has some kind of a sleeping disorder. You know, when you study Peter throughout the Gospels and the Book of Acts, he seems to be sleeping a lot, doesn't he? You know, he has all of these intense moments in history. You know, you remember he was sleeping in the, at the Mount of the Transfiguration. He was sleeping in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now we find him again sleeping. In a, in a very intense moment in history. And you can almost see this angel, you know, behaving like a parent and saying, come on, Peter, get up, get dressed, put your boots on and get on the school bus. You know, it's kind of like, you know, a, a guardian there that's talking to Peter and talking him through it. And, uh, and this angel leads Peter out of the prison and then notice, there's no, there's no emotion between uh, Peter and this angel. There's no emotion, you know, like the angel departs and says, okay, good luck to you, or gives him a big hug or something like that and says, good luck. Yeah. Or they say in Yiddish, gay gazinta, hey, go and enjoy oh, yourself, you know, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, there's none of that, no emotional attachment going on here. The angel just departs. He shows up, he does his job, and he departs. And Peter's now standing in the middle of the road, and, and he's talking to himself, you know, and he's probably trying to just figure out what in the world just happened. I mean, here I was saying to 16 guys, and now I'm free as a bird, you know, and he's, so he's, he's, he's getting his bearings, he's figuring things out, and he's realizing 
the magnitude of what just happened with this angel that he is free and clear. All right, let's take a look now at the next few verses. Um, uh, Debbie Leonhardt, can you unmute? Let me see if I can hear you. Read 12 through 15, please. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to read 12 through 15. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. Thank you. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhonda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. I need to read more. 15. Okay. You're out of your mind, they told her. <laughs> when she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. All right, so there's a couple of things here that you need to understand from a Jewish perspective, uh, an Hebraic perspective uh, that you wouldn't recognize in reading these verses. Where it says it is, a, it is his angel, this was Jewish theology uh, that during this period of time in history, the theology of the rabbinic Judaism, they believed that every person had a guardian angel, and your guardian angel had some format of resemblance to who you looked like uh, as a distinct image as a human being, and your guardian angel supposedly looks like uh, uh, and like you, and when it's time for you to pass on to the other side, their theology said that the guardian angel comes to get you, and so these guys are saying, well, it's probably just the guardian angel. Notice a couple of things here, which I find quite interesting, is that this group of guys, they have this gal, Rhoda, who answers the door, and, uh, um, notice they're not very nice to Rhoda, are they? I mean, she says, hey, you know, Peter's standing at the door. And what do they say? You're crazy. crazy. <laughs> you know, they don't even give her the benefit of the doubt. They just say you're crazy. Uh, you know, you're a crazy woman or something like that. And, you know, where it said, where, you know, what they're saying to Rhoda is, you know, God has not answered our prayers. Now, it's interesting. You know, they're they're praying earnestly, you see. They're praying earnestly for Peter. Uh they're not they're not pretending, they're not playing games, they're not trying to look religious in front of other people. They're 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 just praying earnestly. But but they're lacking faith because when Rhoda says Peter's at the door, they don't believe it. You see, they're lacking faith. But what is what is the thing that you that we have to recognize here? What is the great lesson in these verses that we need to recognize? That even though these guys who are praying earnestly don't have faith, God is answering their prayers. Why? Not because of their faith, but because of their obedience. Because God tells us that we need to pray without ceasing. And so they're being obedient to the word of God. And even with the lack of faith, God is answering prayer because they are being obedient to the word of God. And how many times in each of our lives have we faced some form of adversity? We have no clue what has just happened. We don't know how we're going to get through this situation or this challenge. We're kind of stunned or in shock at whatever the events at hand are. And, and we're told that the Holy, you know, told by the Holy Spirit, just pray. Just pray. We're told to read the written word of God. We're told to pray.
pray the word of God. Um, and the Bible says pray. The Bible says cast all of your cares unto the Lord, for he cares for you. And so we're told just to pray. And even when we think that there is no possibility of getting through some kind of challenge in life, even when we lose our faith in whatever it is that we wish would happen, the fact that we are being obedient to the word of God by actually praying, God will answer the prayers anyway, even though we don't have faith. And what did God do here? God answered these prayers not because of something that these disciples have done, but God answered these prayers not because of the fact that they had faith. That's not what's happening here. These disciples were merely being obedient to the word of God, and that's why God answers prayers to those who are obedient to the word of God. They were doing the right thing, the next right or righteous thing, which is, the Bible says pray without ceasing. So they prayed. They were doing this under obedience to God. And, <laughs> and so at the end of the day, whatever success that you might have in life, it's not because you necessarily earned it, but it's because, because we serve a gracious and a forgiving God uh, uh, who gives us things that we don't deserve. And all he's asking us to do is be obedient to the word of God. So if you pray without ceasing, anything that you need or want that is within God's will, God will provide that for us out of our obedience to the word of God. It's because we serve a rich, graceful, and merciful God, even though we don't deserve these things that if all we do is just pray out of obedience to the written word of God, that God is going to answer our prayers. And that's the reason why prayers are answered. It's because we serve a gracious and a merciful God. All right, we're going to take a pause here for just a few minutes. And the first 15 verses, uh, if you have any thoughts or comments or questions, let's discuss them now. If you have a question, raise your hand. All right, Arnie, you're first. Go ahead. I have Boy, so much. Be... I have so much to say about these first 15 verses. I don't know where to start. But I'll start with verse number uh, four, where it says that Herod was intending to, after the Passover to bring him out and kill him. Okay, I think the reason he, he I think he didn't want to bring him out during Passover because during Passover. The people had the right to ask for one person to be freed from prison. And he may have been afraid they would ask for Peter to be removed from prison, and that would have thwarted his whole program. Uh, when it comes to, you know, Peter sleeping uh, so easily or so well, I think it's because he had, in the past, he had denied Jesus, and that didn't work out so well for him, you know. And so now he's not any longer denying him, and he sleeps in peace knowing that he's in Jesus Christ. I think that's why he's able to sleep peacefully. He knows the Lord is taking care of him. Uh, I just, I have so much to say, I don't want to, I'll stop here and let other people talk first. An interesting perspective, and, and it, it demonstrates that you're thinking things through and you're reasoning things through and thinking things through uh, on Scripture. Good job, Arn. Uh, Boyd, you're next. Can you hear me, Rob? Yes, I can. Go ahead, Boyd. Okay. What's your thoughts? What are your ideas about guardian angels? I know very little about that concept well um i don't know if you necessarily want my thoughts or opinions but what i did share with you in my commentary was that it was it was uh theology it was Jew jewish rabbinic jewish theology that there everybody has a guardian angel okay. um, I, I did not hear um, that i came in late yeah yeah 
uh, that uh, that's the reason I brought it up. I brought it up because you don't you're not going to understand those verses if you don't understand Jewish uh, Hebraic perspective. And according to rabbinic Judaism back in the first century, their theology was that every Jew had a guardian angel that had a resemblance, a physical resemblance of each of us who are physical resemblance. And that when it's time for us to cross over into the afterlife, they come to collect us. And that was what they, why they said to Rhoda, uh, oh, it's just his guardian angel. They didn't believe that uh, Peter was standing at the door. You know, I'll go back. Okay. Nothing okay. chapter and verse on that, if I, that's what I'd say to them. Now, they prayed earnestly, but without faith. I thought that was interesting. Uh, however, God answered because of their obedience to the word. Where it are you? Says, well, we were talking about like verse uh, 15, 14, 15, something. Okay. Uh, God answered because of their obedience to the word, which says we need to be praying without ceasing. So they didn't even believe that God would answer, but they were just being obedient. It says pray without ceasing, and they were praying without ceasing. They weren't praying with faith, but they were praying without ceasing. So it's interesting that God would answer them just because of their obedience, in spite of the fact they didn't express any faith that he would answer. Uh, so, so um you know, they said Rhoda was crazy for telling them that Peter was standing at the door. Now, we need to do the next righteous thing that God commands us to do through his word. And when you're reading the word, wondering what the heck do I do, he'll tell you through his word and pay attention, okay? You know, because we all prayed for Rob to recover, he experienced miraculous healing in about 48 hours. On Saturday morning, we didn't know if Rob was going to make it, and he was released on Sunday. So prayer is effective. The prayers of the saints are effective. Mm -hmm. Debbie Leonhardt's husband got saved after us praying for how many years? A couple of years and a half now. Um, yeah, so we've had so many people in our group pray. Charlie, Renee's son. Uh, mm -hmm. We got people uh, recovering all over the place. And uh, we're, my mother uh, recovered from COVID at 92, and she just celebrated her 93rd birthday on Monday and forgot that she hates me. What Sylvia is pointing out is a huge lesson um, <laughs> from these verses tonight, and that is that even though you may be lacking faith, even though you may not have developed any level of faith, God is telling us through these verses that if you will merely be obedient to his written word, that he will bless you right. and he will answer your prayers. Even without faith, he will. Ask him. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Ask Daniel him. is next, and after Daniel will be Renee. Go ahead, Daniel. Unmute yourself, and then Renee, and after Renee, we'll have Arnie make one more comment. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I guess uh, just, uh, I don't know, a question or a comment. So Boyd was asking about guardian angels. I think guardian, the uh, you know, when you add guardian to the angel part of it, it's kind of a doctrinal type statement that, you know, the, the Jews had, the uh, Catholics have, various people have. But I think it's clear that the scriptures say that there are angels who intercede, right? We see, we see in this lesson where the angel interceded for Peter. We see back in the book of Daniel where the uh, the angel interceded for the uh, the uh, Mad, what was it? the three guys? What are the Ad, uh, Mad, What are their names? <laughs> Anyways, the, the Bad, three Bad, 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 right? And then he also, <laughs> he also God also sent his angel to intercede for Daniel when, when the lion's mouth, right? So okay. very, we see angels all over the place interceding on behalf of humans. Yeah, and so what Daniel's bringing up is a very important point, and Sylvia even made a comment about, well, show me the chapter and verse. When Boyd asked the question, uh, I, you know, the, the point is, uh, I'm not one for giving a lot of opinions with regard to Scripture, 
but but I, I, the reason I brought this up is because because um, we spent four or five months covering the book of Galatians from an Hebraic perspective so that you can learn the truth about what Paul was teaching um, and 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 not confuse it as the church has done with rabbinic Judaism because rabbinic Judaism is all interpretive, it's all opinions, and they've made their opinions higher and more important mm. than the written word of God. And so when you read scripture, as, as Daniel is talking about here, and he gave several good examples out of the book of, 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 uh, of Daniel, mm -hmm. that yes, there are angels. We have numerous scriptures that refer to angels. The, the when you add the term guardian angel, Boyd, the reason that we brought it up is that guardian angel is a reference to in rabbinic Judaism on interpretive measures that is not written in the written word of God, but it's interpretive. And so uh, you remember Jesus made a big to do with the Jewish leaders about why are they you know the 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 uh the Jewish leaders were saying to Jesus, "Why are you interrupting the traditions of man?" and Jesus is saying, "Why are you violating the written word of God yeah. and so <laughs> and so we don't want to confuse the two you've got you've got interpretive law under rabbinic Judaism that discusses um uh guardian angels yet when you when you study the written word of god it refers to angelic uh activity so you can count on the fact that there is angelic uh activity there are angels unquestionably because it's in the written word of god i've been saying that now, on. now when when you when you talk about anything <laughs> that's interpretive uh like like for example guardian angels that would be maybe you'll find it in the Talmud or the Mishnah which are the written uh interpretive laws by rabbinic Judaism you cannot count on that you, yes yes you can find a ton of great wisdom in the Talmud and in the Mishnah uh but please don't get carried away you need to go back and take that wisdom and align it with the written word of God. You cannot place man's interpretation above the written word of God. That's where the rabbinic Judaism and the Orthodox Judaism has gotten into trouble. Uh, and that's what Jesus was referring to with the Jewish leaders. All right, we're going to move on. Good good comment. Uh, thank you for your question, oh, Boyd. Good comment, uh, good work, uh, Daniel. And now we're... And now we're up to Renee, and after Renee, we'll talk with Arm. <laughs> go ahead, Renee. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought you were going to go on. Um, I wanted to tell Boyd that Billy Graham has a wonderful book on angels, and so he can, and he's very scriptural, so he can, you can really um, give you a foundation there on scripture. Um, I've got it, and I've read it. Yeah. Oh, Thank really? You. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and what? I was going to say as well um, about angels as near death experiences. And when people have died and, and they have gone through the tunnel and they have um, been ushered in by an angel and, and they have said, these are the ones that have been watching over you and we're going and we're, and now this is not scriptural, this is natural occurrence, okay? What they have said is that that they were there to take them, usher them into heaven. And so um, and then there have been in these near death experiences, people see their angels when they they leave their body. Now, I happen to believe that. And I think I, I mean, I believe that that um, we do have angels that protect us from harm when we don't even realize we're in trouble. But um, I don't want to tell you that because I don't have this verse and the scripture to say 
that very thing. So I agree with what you're saying, Rob. Um, but also I wanted to say that um, Sylvia, that's exactly what I was thinking about when when everyone was praying for you, 700 people, 600 to 700 people were praying for you. Nobody knew how much faith they had, but they were obedient to pray and go to God for you and to lift you up and, and believe for your healing. So that's it. Yeah, and so what a great testimony it is. Welcome, Hi. Howard and Fran, glad you're here. But what a great testimony that is. Uh, just just confirmation of what happened here with the people that prayed for Peter uh, and all the way up until modern day that you don't have to necessarily have faith in what you're doing, but if you just follow the written word of God and be obedient to it, God is going to bless you in a mighty way. So thank you for that, Renee. Uh, Arnie, you're up next, go ahead. Okay, real quick before I get started, if you don't believe in guardian angels, I can show you one. I have one, her name is Helen. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, uh, Peter thought that this was just a vision. His escape from prison was just a vision. And the reason I think he thought that is he's not, it's not uncommon for him. He saw a vision beforehand when the sheet came down and all the animals and whatnot. That was a vision for him too. So it says in chapter, uh, I mean, verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he was out in the street and the angel had left him now. And so now he's by himself and he realizes that he's not in prison and this is not a vision, it's reality. And I think that that's important to think about because we all, we all have dreams. I have dreams and then I, while I'm dreaming it, I think it's real. And then I wake up and say, oh, thank God that one wasn't real. Um, so, so I understand why he might have thought that it could be a, a vision. The other thing uh, that I want to point out is let's talk about Rhoda. Rhoda must have had faith because this is during the time when Herod is persecuting them. And yet when there's a knock at the door and it could be a bunch of soldiers out there, she runs to the door to answer it. Okay. And her faith made her believe that this wasn't an angel that's a messenger. This was really Peter. Mm -hmm. And she was strong enough that when she went back and told everybody, hey, Peter's at the door, and they said, well, you're crazy. She insisted. She had faith that she knew what she was talking about. I think this is a strong, strong woman. And the last thing I'm going to say to you, I find it fascinating, Rob, that they, <laughs> Peter went to Mary's house. Now, in that time, it's usually the man's name whose house it is. So Mary must have been a widow. And so the house is in her name. And it may, in fact, be the same house where they Jesus had his Passover in that same house. It may be the same house. I, I can't confirm it, but it sounds to me like it's the same house because it's the center of their praying, of the people that are prayer, praying. They're all there. And That's possible. They're possible. probably there because they're mourning. The fact that James uh, was killed by the sword, that, that's John's brother, okay? Yeah, they typically, uh, it's called sitting Shiva. Shiva. Shiva, yeah. Shiva in, in Hebrew is seven. They sit for seven days uh, with family and friends to, uh, uh, to help get through the mourning process. And can I just add on something for Arne's benefit? When you were talking about uh, how Herod Agrippa arrested Peter at Passover, uh, and jailed him for a week. Well, the reason they jailed him for a week was because they weren't allowed to kill anybody during Passover. Yeah, not during the festival. They didn't do it during the festival. All right, Roger Hershey had a comment. Please unmute yourself and speak nice and loud. Welcome to Fran Hershey. Glad you were here. Good to see you. Right at the beginning, when it talks about James, who a brother that was killed. I was somewhat surprised because it was James or Peter, James, and John, which were the three people so close to Christ. 
that uh, mm -hmm. he would be removed from uh, service so early and uh, we don't have any letters from him. I'm surprised that, uh, that mm -hmm. the way God works that people that you would expect uh, would uh, be service longer that uh, his choosing is different. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting perspective. Thank you for that, Roger. Uh, and it's just a confirmation that that it doesn't matter how long we live or how much education we have, we still don't know much of anything in comparison to what God knows. He is so much bigger and grander than we could even imagine. And sometimes we just have to accept uh, the faith that God has has given to us. And we'll talk a little bit more about that after the next few verses. All right, Sylvia's got the last comment. We're moving on after. One other thing, you know, it just struck me about God's grace. Where, uh, where the attacks of the church, specifically James, John's brother, was killed by the sword uh, because he drew people from rabbinic Judaism. Well, his guard was saved because his guard was saved and executed along with James. Now, look, the Lord even used that occasion to extend his grace and mercy to that guard so that he would be eternally saved. Amen. Did you Amen. notice that? All right. Um, thank you for all those comments. Pamela Sage, would you just say a word or two? I want to make sure I can hear you. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Do you have your Bible with you? I don't. My my father being as religious as he was, I would have thought there would have been a few Bibles around here. They must have uh, taken his Bible to my All right. All right. Well, that, fair enough. Uh, we're glad you're here in any event. Uh, okay. Boyd Nixon, would you read verses 16 through 19? 16 through 19. Nice and loud. Okay. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and describe how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. And then it says, then Herod went down from Judea to uh, Caesarea and stayed there. All right, so during this particular time, thank you for reading those, uh, Boyd. During this particular time in history, if you were a guard for the Roman Empire and you lost your prisoner, you as the guard would then be responsible to accept the fulfillment of that prisoner's fate. And so if you were guarding a prisoner who was sentenced to be executed and you lost him, you as the guard would, would be uh, executed uh, in place of the prisoner who was lost. Now, What's quite interesting here is, is that, uh, and this is the part I said we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, you got two apostles here. Uh, this is, this is some food for thought. You got two apostles here and there's no value judgment given to either one of these guys, Peter or James. They're just two apostles. Uh, Nothing in the Bible says that one is better than the other or one is not as good as the other. Uh, we're not told any of those things. We're not told that James had some kind of secret uh, 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 sinful nature that he was hiding up, and that's why God chose to have him executed over Peter. None of that stuff is going on. You've got You've just got two equals here, and one gets to live and one gets executed. And, you know, we see this. We see this in our life. 
You've got two believers that you know uh, both get leukemia, uh, one dies and the other lives on. Or you get you got two brothers or two sisters uh, in the church. They're driving down the road and they get into a car crash. <laughs> and not, not one better than the other. They're just two sisters or two brothers in Christ. One dies instantly and the other walks out of the car without a scratch on their face. And you have to sit and wonder, why is it that God delivers Peter from death row while at the same time God uh, in his sovereignty has James uh, executed through decapitation? You know, how, how can you explain how can you explain where there are two believers and, you know, one gets cancer and, the, and dies and the other gets cancer and, 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 and is, is healed? You know, how do you explain those things? Our human nature, our human nature wants to debate these kinds of things. We want to break it down. We want to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> we want to analyze, we want to unpack it, but remember, none of us are in any position to debate with God. None of us are in a position to figure out what God has in store for our life or why God does certain things, uh, and each of us is going to stand before the throne of God at some point in the future and answer to him. Everything which you have done, every argument that you have ever engaged God in, you're going to have to answer for. And understand that whatever God has done in your life, listen carefully, this is important. Whatever God has done in your life is right. God is right. God is righteous. And we are not. And you and I need to stop arguing and debating with God. We need to stop fighting with God over these issues because most issues are far beyond our comprehension. We just do not understand. There's no theological argument that you can provide as to why James was executed and Peter was set free. There is no theological uh, argument about it. What we need to see is that you have two believers. Oh, Arnie is, is jumping at the bit here. I can see. I'm going to keep you muted, Arnie. What we need to see is you have two believers. One suffers and one does not suffer. And our human nature wants to make some form of justification uh, of these two entirely different outcomes, but it is not for us to explain. It's not for us to know everything that God does. But rather than debating with God, we have to understand things which that are that are far beyond our comprehension. We just need to focus on what is it that God has asked us to do that we can be obedient to his word and stop asking questions about why this has happened or why that has happened. You cannot figure it out. And, 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 and all you need to know is that you need to obey the written word of God. That's all you need to be concerned with in this lifetime is to be obedient to the word of God. All right, Arnie, I'm giving you two minutes. Go ahead. I don't need two minutes. I just have what you've said in many Bible classes. God has a plan. And why Peter instead of James? I don't know the answer, except that God knew that Cornelius was going to need Peter. So he had a plan back then. He probably still has further plans for Peter. Thank you. All right. Well, you, right. you were much more benign than I anticipated. Well, you, All right. Good I job. I just recognize how much uh, spiritual growth you just witnessed over the past <laughs> but, uh, almost two years that since Arn was saved. I just want everybody just to notice that and just be so happy. 
Amen. Because the most unlikely of people, God uses in a mighty way. Amen. Beverly, can we, will you say something? Let me see if we can hear you if, or not. <laughs> All right. Well, um, oh, unfortunately, so can you, we, can we you dial in on your phone? Well, we, uh, we, we love hearing you talk. I'm yeah. sorry. We're going to get a different connection next week that okay. will take care of this problem. But thank you for being here. And I'm sorry you can't contribute. Howard, can you just say, let me just see if I can hear you. Hello, it's good to be here. All right, all right, all right, Howard, would you read verses 20 and 21? Well, I'm not set up yet. I don't have my, I will, I'd love to read in a little bit. Give me five right, minutes. Uh, Carrie Crawford, can you unmute yourself and let me see if I can hear you. Okay, I'm on the phone actually. Can you hear me? Yes, would you read <laughs> verses 20 and 21, please? Please move forward on that, nice and loud. All right, and Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, the king chamberlain, their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. All right, so the imagery you have here is you have one of the wealthiest guys in the world during this era in history. He has authority over human life. He has an overdeveloped ego. And now you've got a couple of guys that are coming down from Phoenicia, uh, their grain exports have been cut off, uh, so there's a lot of uh, brown nosing going on here with the negotiations. Their people are hungry in their country. Uh, they want some grain, and so they're making a presentation uh, to, uh, to Herod Agrippa uh, to get some grain uh, back over to them, and uh, they're in this amphitheater. And we read in verse 20 that he was displeased with them. Now, uh, Carrie, read one more verse, verse 22, please. Okay. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. All right, so we have a first century historian who tells us about this event that this garment that Herod Agrippa was wearing was wholly made of silver, that he came into this amphitheater early in the morning, and so he's facing east, and everybody that's in the amphitheater, their back is towards the sun, the rising sun, and the rising sun is, is, is shining on this garment that's made of silver, and there's there's illumination of, of bright lights from the sun that's, that's coming off of this silver, it's like a sequin uh, uh, a piece of garment. Um, and, and, um, and so you've got, you've got these flashing lights coming off of his garment and people are looking at him and and what are they doing? They're attempting to flatter him by saying, oh, look at him. He is like a god. Of course, that's a small g. Uh, and this guy begins to run his mouth and to talk about how awesome that he is. Again, he was just filled with, uh, with ego, uh, ego, huh? e ego and pride. Uh, on how great he was, and he was just feeding his ego off of this group of people that were saying that, uh, you know, because of his shiny garment that he was like a god. All right, uh, Sylvia, verses 23 to 25, nice and loud. What, what, book, what, book, what book and chapter are you? We're Acts chapter 12, verse 23 through 25. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> At once an angel of the Lord struck him 
because he did not give the glory to big big G God. And he became infected with worms and died. Imagine this. Imagine this. Uh, no comments. Just read it. And then God's message flourished and multiplied. After they had completed their relief mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem, talking along, taking along John, who is called Mark. All right. So uh, the first century historian Josephus tells us that uh, after this, a severe pain arose in his belly. They're talking about Herod Agrippa, uh, and and began a most violent manner. And when he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days, he departed this life being in the 54th year of his age. Now, here's a guy, this is really important to listen to. Here's a guy, he's living the dream, you know, he's, 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 he's living in a, in, a, in a palace on the Mediterranean Sea. He has power over human life. Uh, he's got more money than he could ever spend. But here's a guy who was at war with God. And at the end of the day, if you were to look up Herod Agrippa's palace online, you'll find pictures of ruins. And that is what awaits anybody who is at war with God. Anyone who fights God is going to end up with a life filled with ruin. This guy thought that he was in charge. He thought that he was the master of his own destiny. He thought that he was going to bring success into, into his life. And he does not give any glory at all to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the true God of the universe. And isn't it interesting that if you look up online, we have history of men and women. We have history filled with people who were at war with God, and every single one of them lost the war. Every one of them. When you fight with God, listen carefully, you're going to lose. Each of us has two choices. You either submit to the authority of the one true God of the universe, you surrender, you humble yourselves before God, and, uh, and, and, and God will then raise you up and bless you and give you grace and give you, give you peace. But if you resist, if you resist God, if you're stiff-necked against God, if you are at war with God, then God is going to resist you. But if you just humble yourself before God, the Lord will lead you and guide you. He will grant you grace and peace in your life. Maybe you don't have the faith that you wish that you had. But we learned a very important lesson tonight. You don't need faith. You just need obedience. That's submitting your life to the written word of God. God is only asking for us to be obedient, which means we need to align our lives with the written word of God. And from that obedience is going to follow showers of blessings. And if you want grace, and you want peace in your life, all you have to do, my friends, is be obedient to the word of God. Amen? All right, we've got, um, we've got um, 25 verses we studied tonight. Who's got any comments, questions, or takeaways? Sylvia's first, and then Pamela will be next. Okay, God will honor obedience and bless us, but it's always better to mix it with faith. And I think that the reason that God will bless obedience is so that it can build our faith. Because like we had with the example with Rob and his situation, there are a lot of people that didn't believe that Rob was gonna get healed. They prayed anyway, and God blessed. But as a result, guess what? Their faith was built in the power of prayer. 
Thank you. So there you have it. You know, God can use this to teach us to have more faith. All right, Pamela, unmute yourself and tell me what's on your mind. Yeah, um, when you're talking about faith, you're talking about faith that God will provide or that God will listen to your prayers. You're, you're not talking about faith in Jesus, right? That's right. This, we're not talking about salvation. What we're talking about here is is having faith that your prayers are going to be answered. That's not what God's looking for. He's looking for merely obedience to his word, which is to pray without ceasing. Well, there is right. that other yeah. thing. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, too. But I think Sylvia, I think Sylvia really expressed it properly. Is that is that if you will just exercise obedience uh, and you pray without ceasing, when you when when God begins to bless you for being obedient, that's the very result that helps people to build their faith. But it's not a requirement. It's not a requirement to get started. All he, God is asking us for is to be is to be obedient to his word. Who else has a comment or a question? Go ahead, Brother Dan, you're next. Nice and loud. Yeah, so uh, it's just interesting to note that this uh, this takes place during the, uh, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In the Hebrew, those are the Moedim, or the appointed days, appointed feasts of God. And in verse 21, this is the appointed day of Herod. So basically you have Peter, who's basically freed or redeemed. Uh, Passover is the, the feast of redemption. Peter's redeemed on during this time frame. And uh, on Herod's appointed days, which we were talking about James, why James died and why Peter didn't. Well, in this case, it's Herod's appointed day. And his appointed day, he dies. Interesting. I hadn't seen that. Okay. And so for fi some 1500 years, they've been rehearsing um, the, uh, the, the feast of Passover and unleavened with uh, the perfect sacrifice. Um, and I uh, really hadn't seen that before, but, but um, um, there's a reason why God orchestrated these events on the festival of Passover and unleavened bread to once again demonstrate, and thank you for that enlightenment, uh, Dan, to demonstrate that there are people who, um, who are going to be saved and there are other people who are going to die because of their, their um, lack of a profession of faith in the one true God of the universe. Good job, Dan. I hadn't seen that before. Who else has a comment or a question? Comment, question, or question. Go ahead, Pamela, you're next, and then Renee. I had a question back where, well, I, I, on the timing, because and maybe I missed something because I don't have the Bible in front of me. You can't look at it. But uh, was James killed before then Peter was jailed? Because I thought I heard you say something in the scripture that we were reading that they. He, uh, yeah, what they did at the beginning of this lesson, uh, uh, what I explained was Herod Agrippa uh, was was uh, attacking the church leadership um, and and executing the leaders, and so yeah. what they did was they arrested James and Peter. And uh, James ended up getting executed, and Peter ended up having a um, uh, an angel uh, have him released from prison. Yeah, but I I heard them say something about um, that Peter. Uh, I thought it was Peter said to tell James something after he got out. Was James still alive no, James, when he got out? James, no, no. James is a very common name. Oh, okay, uh, okay. It's a different. So it could be a, a it reference James to a John's brother. Yeah, it a, a different James, James. brother. Yeah. Okay, different. okay, that explains that. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, Renee Stratton, go ahead. Just one real quick scripture, because you always tell us we need to back up what we say by the word. So anyway, in Psalms 91, verse 11, it says, this is about the angel thing. 
for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, one could take that uh, and interpret it as a guardian angel. Interesting. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. That's uh, Psalm 90 what? 91.11. Sign 91.11. Thank you. And I agree because I've been saved by an angel that was wonderful for me. All right, uh, Sylvia's next. Here. Okay, so God is God and we are not. We'll only know why. All our questions about the Bible, why, why, why this, why that, when we see him face to face. Notice that connection? Yeah, and face anyway. to face in the Bible in the Old Testament is a reference to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. Yeah, it's where you're going to be face to face with the Lord. So good job on that. Message. And anyone who fights with God will end up in ruin. Okay, so either we resist, uh, either we submit to God's authority and be blessed, or we resist God, because God will resist the proud. Okay, so that'll end badly. <laughs> so as long as we uh, obey God and submit to His authority. We will be pleasing to him, especially if we're in faith. And uh, he will bless us as a result with shalom, which Amen. is peace, God's peace, God's wholeness, and God's fulfillment. Amen. So if you want a good life, submit to God. Amen. All right, we got a few minutes left. Any other comments? Any other takeaways? Go ahead, Arn. Unmute yourself. Arn? You can unmute yourself, honey. I find, I find it fascinating that John got <laughs> out of prison on the same day that Jesus was resurrected. I like that. I never thought about that, but I like that. It could be a, a parallel that God is pointing to that, yeah. Well, you know, interesting. I hadn't seen that. Um, there's a there's a number of examples in the Bible. Remember, we talked about uh, some verses uh, have literal meanings and other verses have uh, symbolic meaning. There's a lot of scripture that has deeper symbolic spiritual meanings that represent that is a representation of death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. And so that could very well be one of them. Thank you for that, Arn. Good job. I have to tell you. Go ahead, Carrie. Okay. Um, I thought it was interesting that the soldiers were, I'm sure they were afraid because their prisoner had gotten away. And so it was the same response also at the tomb. When uh, the soldiers, when the tomb was ro rolled away and Jesus was gone, so it was a similar situation. And also about um, what happened with Peter, um, that was an, I think, an example of God's grace. He can choose what he gave, he gave his grace and mercy to Peter, but he also had purpose. So we think about what happened with Peter. He ended up handling Herod, um, and before Herod uh, desecrated his feast day, and Herod ended up being desecrated himself. Yeah, and also, yeah, and so he delivered them too. You know, you got Herod Agrippa who is full of himself and acting like he is God of the universe where we really know and we see examples as as uh, carrie is mentioning here that he he does not rule the universe he's not the sovereign of the universe uh he was the sovereign over a governmental agency but but the god of the universe is the one who has full and complete sovereignty uh you know and daniel earlier gave us some examples out of the out of the uh, the prophet daniel where Daniel in the lion's den, he was delivered mm -hmm. from that. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the only mm -hmm. thing that came up in his bodies in the fire, what were their bindings? And so, uh, you know, and so there are numerous examples in the Bible where where 
God shows up and he delivers his people. And uh, those humans that think they're sovereign, God takes care of them. Uh, Carrie, did you have something else you wanted to add? Um, I just also wanted to say, uh, why did Herod leave town after Peter disappeared? Um, but sometimes people act like they have they a sovereign. He had he could kill people. However, also he did not kill Peter during the feast day because usually I think we learned earlier that a lot of people came to town on the feast day, and maybe he did not want um, he didn't want trouble. And then when he couldn't find, uh, when Peter disappeared, he left town because maybe he was uh, uh, over yeah, half of his fact, yeah. yeah, in, in fact, uh, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 16, that's an easy one to remember. There are three festivals that God, uh, after the dis diaspora, the dispersion, where the Jews moved all throughout Asia Minor and uh, Europe, where 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 God said you need to come back each year for these three festivals, and Passover was one of those. And so, typically back in the first century, um, you had uh, uh, you had two and a half million people visiting in uh, Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Now, how do you know that? If you study the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke uh, that that we covered, uh, in which I might just add, every one of those uh, are on video on our YouTube channel, along with 750 other uh, Bible studies. But the point is, thank you. Yeah, the point is, is that uh, they designated 10 people for eating each lamb that was slaughtered for Passover. And we know that they slaughtered 250,000 lambs. So you can you can say that there were, if you do the math, there were two and a half million people that were there during the, the feast of Passover. And so it might've had something to do with that, Carrie. I hadn't seen that before, but that maybe uh, he was sick. He didn't accomplish his goal. He was probably embarrassed. He left town for a while because there was a very large audience there. Uh, Brother Daniel, uh, unmute and uh, you get the final comment. And we're going to go to prayer after that. Yeah. So one. Uh, so in the last last verse, it says, "And Barnabas and Saul returned when they had fulfilled their mission to Jerusalem." So that word "fulfilled" is the same word. It's pleru. It's the same word that Jesus, uh, whoops, sorry. It's the same word that Jesus says in Matthew 5, uh, verses 17. Do not presume that I came to abolish the law or prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So basically it says uh, Barnabas and Paul, <coughs> Uh, came back from Jerusalem after they fulfilled their mission. Jesus has two comings, right? In his first coming, he fulfilled part of the mission, but not all of the mission. Excellent. Good job, Daniel. All right. Um, I just want to mention to you, thank you for that insight, uh, Daniel. It's always lovely to hear what you have to say. Uh, next Monday, we're going to cover the first 12 verses in chapter 13 of the book of Acts. This Thursday, we'll cover the first uh, 14 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, we're, we will send out a new and different link. Uh, hopefully, that will eliminate any audible or audio problems uh, for the next many uh, weeks. Uh, so hopefully we will um, we won't have these problems anymore. Just want to thank each and every one of you for your faithful attendance. We're we're truly grateful. Uh, I do have a quick prayer request. Uh, when I was in the hospital last week for uh, pneumonia and some format of a central nervous system infection. Um, 
they uh, they chose to take me off of chemotherapy. And so I've been off chemotherapy now for two weeks. Um, and uh, a decision is going to have to be made as to whether I stay off or go back on. So I'm going to make an appointment with the oncologist uh, for blood tests just to see how things are progressing without the chemotherapy. But I would just ask for your prayers that God's will uh, be right in the middle of all of that uh, as we uh, seek uh, the advice of our oncologist. So thank you for that. I'd like, uh, uh, again, just thank each and every one of you for your faithful attendance. We love each and every one of you. appreciate being a part of this wonderful group of people who are really pursuing the Word of God. So thank you for, uh, for sharing your lives with us. I'd like two volunteers just to sort of feel compelled just to raise one of your fingers and, and say, I want to close in prayer. Who would like to close? This? Pamela is one. Who is the second? And we got, uh, we got a high hand raised, uh, Brother Daniel. So, Pamela, you can start us. And, Daniel, if you'll unmute and finish us, let's go to the Lord and prayer to close. Lord Jesus, we lift you high. We know that you are sovereign and that you are in control. Give us faith always in everything throughout all that we do. This past year, we've experienced things that we could not have imagined. Help us to know that you are definitely in control and that we don't need to be concerned about what's happening. Won't you be with your faithful children that are in this Bible study throughout the next week? Bless them. Keep them in your care. We ask these favors in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Uh, dear Father God, uh, we're looking forward. Uh, tonight we were talking about the, uh, the Passover unleavened bread, which is... Uh, Right around the corner for us uh, in the next month, uh, we'll be celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and we just uh, thank you for his sacrifice, for what he has done for us. But, uh, we don't want to take it uh, cheaply, Lord. We want we don't want to have a cheap grace. We want to we want to uh, be uh, uh, not just uh, hearers of your word, but doers of your word. That we would uh, hear what you're saying. That we would. Uh, uh, bring righteousness to, to the lost, uh, to the to sick and dying world, that we would preach your name, your son's name to them, and that they would they, they would repent and they would turn to you, and we'd have, see a glorious harvest uh, uh, come about. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you all for your faithful attendance tonight.